everyone to the series of lectures which will be given by Professor Leonard Mischewitz, the professor from uh, Central European University, and he also teaches at the, at the University of Maribor in Slovenia. Um, you know some details about his biography from the poster, which was published in the internet and so on, and perhaps I won't comment a lot on that. You will maybe talk a bit more if you think it's needed. And uh, that's going to be like a series of three lectures. Today is the first lecture, and, uh, um, and tomorrow there will be a lecture on thought experiments in political philosophy at 5 p.m. at the same place. Um, and the last lecture will be on epistemology, on deep and superficial a priori. Um, so today, uh, today's lecture is called Philosophy Between Science and the Humanities, and I'd like to welcome and invite you to welcome Professor Ed Mishkic. Thanks a lot. Uh, this is my first time in Lithuania. I'm actually from Croatia, uh, and then I teach around, and uh, I must say I sort of started feeling at home very quickly here. It's very similar to, to, to my countries. I talked a bit with students. I gave a closed lecture at, when, at one, I think, and... Uh, after a very short time, I really felt like I'm teaching at home. So maybe I made a mistake. Maybe everything I'm saying is shocking and terrible. But I have a feeling it's not. I think it's like, like at home. So uh, if I speak, if I begin speaking too quickly, uh, just, inter just interrupt me and tell me to slow down. Or you can just give me a sign. You know. Don't do this. No, no, not that sign. <laughs> Shut up. But... I can speak more slowly. If, if in the discussion, uh, uh, if you want to ask a question and you are not completely sure about your English, uh, можно разговариваться по русски. У меня нет проблем с русским языком. Oder wenn Sie eine Heideggerianerin sind oder Hegelianerin, uh, dann können wir es auch auf, auf Deutsch diskutieren. So don't, don't bother, don't worry about you, 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 I don't understand Lithuanian, but this will come. So, uh, uh, so if, you, if you don't feel like asking in English, if it's easier for you, uh, Russian or German, uh, no problem. Just ask. Uh, the problem with the lecture that I've got is that is very long, so I will be trying to cut it as I as I talk. Uh, uh, Mindaugas has a comment that it's actually a semester of lecturing, you know, concentrated in one thing. But okay, let's let's do it. So I'm I'll be talking I'll be talking from the perspective of analytic philosophy. Uh, because this is what I'm doing, but I'll be talking about both sides of contemporary philosophy, analytic and continental. And I, I would taking, I'm taking as one sort of sign what is analytic philosophy, that it is explicitly argumentative, uh, with a bit of logic, and it's basically, it's tried to proceed either from commonly acceptable plausible or scientifically uh, inspired premises. So uh, if, you, if you've been doing continental philosophy, if you've been doing authors like, say, Heidegger or Nietzsche or Kierkegaard, uh, then you will remember that it's very often the point in philosophy is to shock the reader with something that appears widely implausible that is somehow expected that philosophy would go contrary to common sense and contrary to science. So there is this, this uh, in, on the continental side, there is a lot of negative attitude to science. 
uh, and you expect philosopher to, so leaving aside science and just concentrating on common sense, you expect philosopher to say something extravagant, at least. Sometimes, you know, it's even good to be a bit crazy with what you, what you claim. Of course, analytic people also claim crazy things. But in the analytic philosophy, if you claim crazy things, you have to show that this is something supported by science. There is this respect for science. And there is a long, long tradition in analytic philosophy uh, that uh, the emblematic name in this tradition is late Wittgenstein, which is that we try to bring philosophy in accord with common sense. So that one way how you evaluate a philosophical thesis is whether it can be made to accord with common sense. Uh, a normal continental Marxist would say that this is just a petty bourgeois, you know, so-called common sense. A Nietzschean would say, you know, that this is terrible, and he would add, and Jewish, in <laughs> brackets, but then the neo nietzscheans would delete the Jewish part. Uh, uh, Heidegger would think the same thing, but he wouldn't say it. <laughs> yeah, he would write it down somewhere, and then they would dig it up much later. So, uh, analytic philosophy, analytic tradition, sees philosophy as prominently rational and closer to science than to art and religion. Let me just give, me, give you a, a contemporary example here. Uh, you know, somebody who is, who is really good in analytic philosophy might interrupt me and say, oh, come on, Anna, you are describing analytic philosophy from the times of when you were young, 100 years ago. Uh, now it has all changed. No, it has not changed. You've got people like uh, this guy. So if you, if you travel right down, and you get at the opposite end of the Earth, so Australia and New Zealand. You get, uh, you get these people, uh, Frank Jackson and his school in Canberra, and they keep saying that, you know, we should, what do you do with, you know, when you are interested in the philosophical terms or in, you know, any kind of fundamental categories, he says, yeah, what you do, you know, is you collect the banalities people normally say about it. Uh, and then you make a big network out of these banalities. This is not, he, he's not Wittgenstein, he's not Wittgensteinian, but it's again this kind of thing that you want commonly acceptable, plausible initial premises. And then you can go and do complicated things, but you do it by applying logical argumentative reasoning to these commonsensically acceptable premises. You do this not only in theoretical philosophy, but also you do it, and you do it massively, you do it massively in ethics and political philosophy. I had as a guest uh, two weeks ago, I had a, we had a famous contemporary political philosopher, his name is Gerald Gauss is like that mathematician Gauss, so the wrong Gauss. Okay? And uh, Gauss is writing these books about uh, pluralism of opinions in politics and political philosophy. He says, you know, the, the, our present day society, he doesn't mean Lithuania, he doesn't mean Slovenia or Croatia or Hungary, we are all homogeneous, very, very homogeneous. He's thinking of societies where you've got, you know, uh, uh, Christians, Muslims, uh, all sorts of uh, ethnic, like U.S., like, like Australia, the immigrant, immigrant societies. Even Jews. Sorry? Even Jews. Jews. Even Jews. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but he's not Jewish. And, and, uh, he says, you know, how, how do we find the rules for living together? And one motivation for this, you know, wanting, you say, okay, now we have, he's looking at the complicated ways of finding a compromise. 
Well, one idea is you have to respect common sense. You have to respect ordinary views of people. You don't come from above and say, gee, you know, I, was, I had a revelation from being itself saying that you should do this, this, and this. Uh, you go from the common sense and you build, in this case, you build the structure of your political philosophy from various common senses. In this case, it's pluralism. Uh, uh, similarly in ethics. Similarly in ethics, and, and it's a kind of interesting open question. So, uh, okay. Uh, then we've got continental that you know what it is. This I don't have to explain. We've got the history of the divorce. Uh, so it's, it's Kant that is basically the last common ancestors, after which the two sides stop sleeping with each other. You've got a serious marriage divorce, and it's lasting and it's is developing, actually. So, uh, sometimes you hear people, people come and you know, call American colleagues, and they say, oh, come on, Anna, you know, it doesn't make sense, the distinction, continental and philosophy. They're just good and bad philosophy. You say, yeah, maybe it's true. Who are the good philosophers? And somehow, all the good philosophers have American family names. <laughs> well, 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 this is, you know, it's okay for politics, but it's not a good, good uh, uh, style for, for philosophy. So, I must say that continental philosophy has been vastly more interested in catering to the immediate and pressing concerns of art and humanities, and successful in doing so. So... Uh, <coughs> And also philo uh, continental philosophy was ready to tolerate, if not to encourage, essayistic style, a mixture of literary and philosophical manner of writing. Uh, it kept referring, it keeps referring to cultural matters. Uh, very often uh, now you get a point made through a story from a movie, or you get only movies. Uh, if the guy is more conservative, then you get grand German or French poetry. So you've got Hölderlin on the one hand, on the other hand you've got Mallarmé. If you don't know what is a coup de day, the guy doesn't talk to you. There's no one who is a philosopher that I know knows what is a coup de day. Uh, I, I learned it by accident. So you all know what it is. Good. So uh, it's, it's artistic and... La Coup de Dé is a poem which starts with something that the analytic people would see as the axiom of probability theory, which says that one fall of uh, whatever it is, the, the device for the probability thing, so in this case it's a, uh, what is it could be a coin. Die. Yeah, die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one one throw of a die does not change the hazard, the contingency. Of course, it doesn't. It's axiomatic. But Mallarmé thought it was very poetic. So, uh, and this is constantly quoted, all the time. So it's constant reference to uh, literary and philosophic uh, mixture of literary and philosophical manner of writing. It's constant reference to matters cultural artistic. It's willingness to give up the truth directedness and the goal of clarity and elimination of ambiguity in the interest of other goals, artistic finesse, political militancy or provocation and the like, it has made it much more acceptable to the departments of, say, English, French cultural studies or film theory. So it has been successful in, 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 in sort of cultural life. Well, this is something to keep in mind. Analytic philosophy itself, uh, see, at least since logical positivism, 
it was it's been uncomfortably balancing between two cultures the scientific and the humanistic one so two out of the three founding fathers of analytic philosophy so Frege and Russell saw it as clearly aligned with scientific culture they were both fashioning and using new mathematical logical tools in order to ground mathematics which was seen and is probably still seen as the queen of scientists sciences and Russell together with early Vienna circle set out to deal with excited new issues raised by evolutionary by revolutionary physics so it was relativity theory and quantum physics that was sparing the philosophers in in Vienna circle but philosophy as a whole has been associated with arts and humanities throughout the 19th century and it has kept this liaisons until the present time some discipline like aesthetic ethics political philosophy and philosophy of history clearly addressed issues central to humanities while others like philosophy of mind and language have at times shared the ground with humanistic culture so analytic philosophy started on this scientific side and and had a had a problem with the with the history of humanistic disciplines had a had a clear problem with with you know art and and, and literature etc uh, now, in last half century, say, uh, or say let's say or the time since the Second World War, analytic philosophy is slowly recapturing that ground. So, uh, if Carnap and and these people, if they came to life today, they would have probably they would probably say that you know it is shocking that there are so many analytic philosophers that are doing culture and cultural stuff, and uh, it's incredible that you know so much money for analytic philosophy goes for ethics and for political philosophy Carnap would be completely shocked with this I would I would think and and uh, 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 so uh, you know when when even when I started doing analytic philosophy you know my teachers were saying things like you know you should forget about natural language you should learn logic uh, you know the every small discovery every small technical discovery in logic was healed as a total revolution in philosophy uh, now it's changing now uh, you've got you know when you, you look at good mathematicians logicians you know where they sell their products they sell it to computer business they don't sell it to philosophers and philosophers are not buying them anyway it's, it's there's been a there's been a, a lack of interest in small technicalities you've got somebody like Tim Williamson in Oxford who says oh we should bring logic back into philosophy we should really doing logical do it logically but then we look at what he's doing it's not so technical it's not a super technical technical kind of logic that my teachers were pushing me to learn in order to be able to do analytic philosophy so the analytic philosophy has recaptured re recaptured some of the territory it completely lost at the time of Vienna Circle it's getting it got less technical it's very pedantic it's still very very pedantic very argumentative but it's somewhat less technical these days you know with Rawls normative ethics and political philosophy have gained a, gained a firm footing later you get a bit of analytic aesthetics etc etc so you are getting what's happening is that more and more areas are being either touched or uh, even half conquered by analytic philosophy now I want now to change the topic a little bit I want to uh, to look at the opposite side and I would like to let's look a bit at the problems that that uh, the opposite the, the other side had the continental side so uh, here is Foucault with some hair uh, uh, I was told by a lady student that she said okay now I can fall in love with him after she has seen this picture so I thought you might like it 
in the propaganda for for Foucault. So, uh, uh, if you don't like it, I've got tons of pictures without hair. So, uh, I want to, I want to, uh, to tell you a little bit uh, about what I see as a kind of bad development in continental philosophy. I will give you just one example. And I was I was giving other examples in the uh, in the afternoon, and I uh, I got a question about why I'm so pessimistic about the stuff. And uh, I want to. This is the thing. I think that the postmodernism seems to be leading the central stream or a central stream of continental philosophy into collapse. And I want to uh, sort of illustrate a little bit what's happening on the example of Foucault. Uh, I, okay, so Foucault, <laughs> what I want to point out, uh, just so to, to tell you the truth, I want to point out uh, contradictions in Foucault, but it's not... I'm not being nasty. I think that uh, you know, if you are if you are a very creative philosopher, if you are a very creative thinker, and you have to live some number of years, you will be getting into different doctrines. You know, you you, you can't just keep on, on with one one big idea. It's almost human impossible. But I want to show you what happened with these contradictions. That that's the the thing I, I want to concentrate. So here is here is Foucault writing about. Methodology. He calls his own way of investigation, following, borrowing the term from Nietzsche, he calls it genealogy. And here's the description. Genealogy is gray, meticulous, and patiently documentary. So it's basically it's pedantic stuff. It operates on a field of entangled and confused parchments. Uh, parchment is what we call in Slavic languages pergament. You might, uh, if you, if you the, the word parchment is not super popular. So it operates on field of entangled and confused parchments. So it's an archive and it's not a digital archive. It's not a... a you know, the normal script archive is confused and entangled parchments. On documents that have been scratched over and then recopied many times. Uh, gee, you know, sounds like, you know, you are really after the facts. You are really, you know, digging up all these documents because you want to have the sort of absolutely reliable data. You, you, why, why, why would you go and, and read that stuff unless you are into the data? He claims emphatically that genealogy requires uh, knowledge uh, on the, uh, and it depends on a vast accumulation of source material. Mm -hmm. Let me call this approach knowledge accum accumulating approach. Foucault writes, quoting Nietzsche, that he is interested in discrete and apparently insignificant truths. But it's only apparently insignificant. Apparemment insignificant truths. And they are truths. They are la vérité. Okay? Genealogy is thus geared to truths. And this is what I'm describing, what I call knowledge, sorry. Uh, I call this knowledge accumulation. But in Foucault, you find also the opposite view. Let's call it knowledge subversion. He keeps saying knowledge is something very bad. Some commentaries see this militant, subversive drive as essential to genealogy itself. So one of the new books on Foucault, recent books, by Best, says that the shift from archaeology to genealogy was accompanied by a parallel shift from aloof archivalist 
to impassioned militant. Now, I find this scandalous as a formulation because uh, he says uh, the militancy. The militancy goes with genealogy. And Foucault just said that the genealogist is working on entangled and confused parchments. So genealogist in the, is in the archive. So how can you go away from archive if you are a genealogist? So don't buy Beth's book. I think he's cheating with the family name. He's not the best. He should be called Worst. Uh, but anyway, uh, typically he sees, he's stressing in Foucault this militant, destructive note as against the factual and accumulative one. And here is Alan Manslow. So here's the summary of how he sees Foucault. Foucault confronts the empiricist charter by arguing that history is never objective. Uh, because it cannot be independent of the historian and his or her own time or cultural contest, and it is the power of language to create meanings rather than to discover the true direction that history has taken that is important. As a result, to be honest to herself and her reader, the historian must avoid any claims to an empiricist guaranteed disinterested objectivity located beyond the cultural frontier in which she lives. So you, you get the picture. No objectivity. History is our construction. It's a completely opposite thing from the first, the first story. And says the reasoning behind this position is Foucault's sustained attack on the reconstructionist belief in the adequate representation of reality to the narrative form. Not only is objectivity a myth, but more significantly we should recognize the sheer impossibility of the modernist theory of referentiality between words and things, statements and evidence. When you translate it into a little bit less posh language, it means that it's a myth that words refer to things. Uh, so the question is how do you order the soup? if the word soup does not refer to soup. Uh, but it's a very complicated question, as you can see. Uh, it's, a modern, it's a modernist theory of referentiality. You should give up the idea that words refer to things. So, you know, when... Uh, I mean, Dauga says this is Nenad Mischevich. Actually, this was all wrong. The name does not refer to me. It's just a modernist uh, complot or whatever. In all this, his main concern is to demythify history's claim, to represent the reality of the past, and through it is further assertion that explanation can in some ways be complete or reasonable or realistic. This becomes clear when those possessing power make an appeal to history to rationalize their hold on power. At this point, Manslow scratches his head and says, oh no, the legitimating authority of history is also used by those trying to get the power. You know, these are the fighters for the good cause. They also falsify history. So you, you, see, the, you, see, the, you see the view of history as a discipline. So uh, uh, I was looking at this, uh, uh, what is this, this, this thing? that your first king built on the uh, slope, on the mountain slope. And I was looking at the, I was looking at the churches, the, the Jesuit stuff and the Orthodox stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And I was looking at uh, Mitzkevich getting a Lithuanian name and having his face on the wall. Jaslav Milos, etc., etc. So I guess Lithuania is like my country. In this sort of countries, uh, we have all been very sensitive to the activities of historians who have tried to reconstruct as well as they could the real history of our peoples. 
We are all fed up with historians who have sold themselves to power, to, to government. Uh, we're fed up with great something, whatever it is, great Russia, great Poland, great Lithuania, great Croatia, great Serbia. We want history as it really was. Tell me you know, how many people spoke what language. Was Lithuanian a separate and distinct language in 15th century? Yes or no? Give me the documents. Tell me that. Uh, Croatian and Serbian, how did they diverge? By normal linguistic standards, is this one language or two languages? Now that they are officially two languages, is this a political decision or is this something that follows the nature of language? And we had good historians in, in Croatia that were honest historians. I remember, so the guy was, so we have a saint which has a funny name. It's a Croatian kind of variation on the original name. And it's a saint that's being, you know, it's taken as a, he's taken as a Catholic saint. He has a big church in the town where I was teaching and he is being super loved by people. And so there is a war with Serbia. I was sitting and drinking under the picture of the saint. And I say, gee, guys, you know where the saint comes from? And they said, no, where could he come from? Well, he comes from Byzantium. And his original name, his original name uh, really means uh, born, in the, gold, born, born in, the, in, the, in the golden chamber, which means that he was son of the Byzantine emperor. And they said, this can't be. I said, no, there is a history book that tells you how this guy came there, how they, he came to the town. Byzantine emperors were doing propaganda for Orthodox faith, so they were sending bits and pieces of the saints to various places. So you could get a leg of saying this, you could get an ear of saying that, etc. And we got a little bit, I, don't, I forgot which organ it was, but a little bit of some organ of St. Chrysogonus, and that's the guy. I wouldn't have known this except for the honest historian who in the time of the biggest Catholic Orthodox conflicts was writing down you know, how Croatia was swallowing bits and pieces of Orthodox saints and making cathedrals around these little bits and pieces. This is what I think his history is for. Whereas here, the history is not representing the past. The history is reconstructing. The historian is inventing a narrative. There, is, there are no rational explanations in history, etc., etc., etc. Like Nietzsche, Foucault has come to accept that all modernist claims are ultimately spurious. He is particularly scornful of the efforts of naive empiricists to locate the historical truth which they believe to be timeless and essential. He argues that history is fabricated and we are implicated in it, so we are wrong to conclude that we can stand outside it. So history is just our fabrication. And then he says, yeah, gee, you know, but why, then, why is then Foucault looking for evidence in the archive? You realize that there's something bad about this stuff, which, you know, you look at the documents. Why would you look at the documents if it's all like a novel? And then he says, well, for a fact to be accurate or not, there does not have to be a relation of correspondence between discourse and the real. Nonetheless, the protocols we make are themselves the product of history, turning out to depend on consensus and social construction. So historians are sitting down, they get drunk, they reach consensus, they socially construct historical facts, and this is fantastic. Come on. So, this is, so in Foucault, you've got three stories. I've told you very quickly, I've told you two stories. One story is this archive work. The second story is Deconstruction. We deconstruct everything. There is no tools. Everything is, is, is just construction, and it's construction of the power. 
The third story about which I didn't tell you, and I don't feel like telling you much about it because it's very Marxist, uh, which is the following thing, that Foucault says that there is good knowledge and bad knowledge. And how do you get the good knowledge? You take people who are being oppressed, not the whole working class, like Marxists say, but particular oppressed people. So you've got, you get the cleaning lady, you get the nurse in the hospital, you get, uh, basically, besides the nurse in the hospital. Here you probably get cleaning lady. So the cleaning lady knows the truth about the academic life because she's been oppressed. And then you combine the knowledge from the archive about the history of the university with the particular knowledge of the cleaning lady. And the historical knowledge should help the cleaning lady in her fight for a more just relations in the academia. And this is good knowledge. So you've got this, this third construction is good knowledge which comes out of the harmony between the oppressed class and the erudites. So it's three stories. The archive story, the deconstruction story, and the good cleaning lady knowledge. Which one survived in the, which one was accepted, which one was commented in the Anglo-American tradition, which one sold Foucault best? The deconstructive story about history being our invention, so the worst thing got sold. So this is this is this is my diagnosis. I'm taking Foucault as example. You've got you've got three three stories. You've got three kinds of approaches. I'm, I, we can discuss Foucault in detail if you want uh, in the discussion period. You've got three stories. The story that is obviously the most destructive, and uh, which is to my taste the worst story, is the only one that gets preserved in the postmodernist reading of. Foucault. So <laughs> this is my worry about the other side, about the continental tradition. Uh, it went worse with literary style tradition of Derrida, which turned into sort of politically engaged intellectual poetry. And you have this terrible scenario of Alain Badiou becoming the most prominent French continental philosopher. But you was the least talented of the great philosophers, Deleuze, Derrida, Foucault. But he lived healthily and outlived them. So Deleuze had a tuberculosis. There was nothing to be done about it. Uh, Althusser had a wife that was fatal to him. Uh, Foucault was a kind of relatively monogamous homosexual who discovered Californian free sex exactly at the time when the epidemic of AIDS started. So that was the end of Foucault. And the only super non-talented guy in the group was Alain Badiou and he survived. He was living a healthy sporting life. And now this least talented guy is the main French continental philosopher. And he's applying the theory of infinite sets to revolution and social protest. His pupil, Meyasu, is a little bit more sentimental on the religious side. And he has this fantastic theory that we should believe in God because God doesn't exist. You read the book. So on my, on my reading, as far as we're dealing with French tradition, it's a disaster. It's a complete catastrophe. I was, I was well, I won't talk about myself. Uh, so uh, 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 I was basically in love with French tradition. I can't believe what has come out of it. So this is the looked a little bit at, 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 at analytic philosophy, kind of passing to this domain of culture. We're now looking a little bit at the op opposing side, the continental tradition, uh, descending into hell. 
basically, ending up with this postmodernist chaos and not being able to get out of it. Pop culture and daily politics get, get combined in the theory that uh, emerged after the snap between continental and analytic stuff. The worst scenario is that continental tradition ends as pop philosophy. That you've got uh, politically inspired authors, uh, some of them I'm politically very much with them, we, we agree politically. You know, politically inspired authors that do basically pop philosophy on politically engaged topics, and that's, I think, the worst scenario. Uh, so, it seems, at least to me, that only analytic tradition can save the good continental topics from the continental disaster. So that's the, that's the line, that, that uh, with, with this postmodernist earthquake, uh, a lot of the good stuff is just being destroyed, there are interesting to topics in analytic tradition, in continental tradition, and I think they could be saved if we apply to them the anal analytic ways of thinking. Uh, so my first advice to analytic colleagues is not to switch the camp, is to stay with the methods of arg argumentative style, but, and then comes but, uh, but, widen it to other topics. Uh, my second, my third story would be about a uh, fanatical scientism in analytic philosophy, what is now called experimental philosophy, but I think I've eaten all the time, right? Sorry? How, how long have I been talking? 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Okay, let's see. Let's see what we've got. So how much do we have in all, all, all in all? 90 minutes or? Well, the usual is 90 minutes, but guest lectures usually make it faster. Faster? Shorter. 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 <laughs> yeah, but you won't Gee. Have Sorry? Okay. Okay, so I'll just go on with, with some of the advice and then I'll stop. And if you want this, this uh, thing about scientism, we can return to it in the discussion and I'll show you the slides. So, uh, now what... Uh, what should we do in doing analytic philosophy? I think where the science is helpful, I think where the science really should inspire us, is looking for explanation. Uh, there are analytic philosophers who follow the lead of the late Wittgenstein who think that we don't need serious explanations in philosophy. Uh, you just have a kind of analysis of language, you give up explaining, and the most famous guy uh, today on, along these lines is McDowell. But you get elements of this in Brandom, you get it in other authors. And this uh, introduces the temptation of what they call quietism. Quietism, meanings, is a famous doctrine that you should keep quiet. No, <laughs> quietism is the idea that uh, when you are asked why, you just shut up. You say philosophy is not doing explanations. Uh, I asked McDowell, I said, look, suppose you have, a, you have a problem that philosophers are worried about. Suppose you've got mind-body problem, how is it possible, you know, that such a nice mind is residing in such a boring body? Well, uh, suppose that uh, we get an answer. Suppose that we get a, a kind of scientific story about how psychology emerges from the 
bodily constitution from brain and the rest. Wouldn't you find it interesting? And McDowell said, yeah, it would be very interesting, but it it's not a philosophical question. It's this kind of antipathy to science that I think is very bad. I think, I think that, that analytic philosophy uh, should, should stay with explanation. Because traditionally, philosophers have been curious, enthusiastic, sometimes even fanatical about explanation, about why and how possibly questions. Plato introduced his series of ideas and of recollection as honest ex attempts to give explanatory account of a whole range of public phenomena. Kant thought that the main task of theoretical philosophy was to account for our mysterious capacity of knowing things a priori. You, you know, you remember the, the, the famous question, you know, where, where the hell, how the hell do we have mathematical, synthetic, a priori knowledge? This is called transcendental question, if you, if you remember in, from reading Kant. Uh, it's an explanation question. It's a question, how is it possible? How do we explain this? It's not a normative question. It's a question of explaining. So the best mainstream of philosophy was really into explanation of deeply puzzling phenomena. Plato, Descartes, Locke, Leibniz, and Kant were all combining a tough normative stance and an immense philosophical enthusiasm for explanation. So I think analytic philosophy should stay with this. Uh, s many of the explanations these philosophers were offering were the straightforward answering of why questions, or how come questions. The aim was systematic, unified explanation of broadly causal type. In the case of Plato, Descartes, and Locke, as a, uh, in, uh, and a kind of constitutive explanation in the case of Kant. By concentrating on such questions, an analytic philosophers continued the mainstream of philosophy as we know it from the classics. This really, uh, this is what continental, continentals have given up on explanation, on, on systematic big explanation of facts. Analytic philosophy still has a chance to continue this mainstream line of classical philosophy by staying with, with the explanatory stuff. Uh, more importantly, of course, explanation, explanatory issues pop up everywhere in philosophical work. Uh, so philosophers of mind are aware of this, but of course now you have this awareness in ethics and everywhere else. The epistemologists and ethicists who don't like the explanationist approach seek a safe haven in the normative character of their discipline. They say, well, epistemology is just doing normative stuff, uh, uh, it's about justification, it's not about explanation. But take explanation and epistemology. You ask what is knowledge, but once you propose the working conception, you wonder how is it possible to have knowledge as conceived. A lot of debate about skepticism focusing upon the credibility of account uh, 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 that we can offer. The same thing with justification. Where do norms of justification come from? How come our beliefs are answerable to normative standards? And once you descend to particular sources of knowledge, the need for explanation increases. Mathematical, logical, and modal knowledge. I just came from a conference on self-knowledge. And half of the conference was really explanatory stuff. Uh, I know now that I'm getting thirsty. And if you say, oh no, Nena, you are just you know, uh, becoming an alcoholic and you think that you are thirsty, but actually you're not. I say, gee, you know, it's my thirst, it's not yours. Come on. I know that I'm feeling thirsty. I know that my throat is getting, that's the good news for you, my throat is getting dry and sore, so I'll stop talking after a while. Uh, but I know it. How do I have this super knowledge of my own momentary mental states? We had two days of discussion of this. Officially, there are like seven theories about it, and each has sub-theories. And it's all explanatory stuff. It's all answers to the question, how possibly can I have this sort of knowledge? <coughs> I have to do something about this knowledge. I'm getting seriously thirsty. Even if it's not vodka, I, I will drink it. Okay.
So I think one important advantage of continent of analytic philosophy uh, in comparison to continental is this passion for explanation that it really brings her in line with the main main philosophical tradition of, of philosophy, Western and Eastern. So what should we do? Well, final advice. So what, 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 what could one recommend? So I, I, I guess uh, there were some analytic philosophers sitting here. And there are some elsewhere, but uh, I, sort of, I can sort of recognize this side. And there are some non-analytic who are laughing at me. So, yeah, you can see the scenario. So uh, what would be the advice? One would be to enlarge the areas of interest that analytic philosophers should start dealing with things like art. Now they're dealing a lot with uh, issues applied to political issues. But uh, people are doing some social ontology. But I think philosophy of history, for example, is a topic that was very prominent in 19th century and part of 20th, and that analytic philosophers almost didn't address at all. So there are areas that uh, uh, we should, analytic philosophy should extend in. Second is keep the explanationist broadly naturalist paradigm. Do not retreat it to quietist, but make it relevant for the old cultural topics. And then when it comes to public relations, I think on the practical side, we should not be ashamed of our political views. Uh, the analytic philosopher, he has a tradition of, it's kind of funny. Uh, you know, you say, you know, say, gee, you know, what is, I heard today a, a colleague saying uh, that continental philosophers were better on practical political issues. And I thought of Vienna Circle and the continental scene at that time. So Moish Lick was sort of center-left, center-leftist in his views. Uh, he was killed by a guy who was basically a kind of Nazi, proto-Nazi guy, but there you've got what is called in philosophy of science over-determination, because Schlick was sleeping with the girlfriend of the guy. So it's not clear that the thing is political. But then you've got Paul Natop. Natop was socialist who emigrated when the Nazi danger reached Austria. Carnap was engaged socialist who believed in Esperanto and world government. These were analytic guys. The biggest name on the continental side was Heidegger, who was member of the Nazi party. And then you get the claim that continental philosophers were better on the practical political side. That's very interesting to hear. Better where? Better with what? Better with the choice of political party. Well, well, well. Well, the positions they got, if you just to think about Heidegger and Karl Marx, sorry, uh, better according to the positions they got. I mean, look at Heidegger. Yeah, there is there is an interesting investigation about Heidegger's change of views on technology. So this is this technic and and techne and so on. It starts with he has a, has a time of enthusiasm period of enthusiasm for technique, for technology. And then he gets more and more disappointed. So a Dutch historian of philosophy was comparing the dates of his publications and writings with political dates. Turned out, m probably just a coincidence, that his enthusiasm of technology was following the victories of Wehrmacht. When, where, after Stalingrad, where Wehrmacht went down, he reached this incredibly intelligent position that technology is not so important and it's not going to save Germany. So much about continental philosophers being essentially better politically than analytic ones. 
Uh, people who stayed in Germany, people who did not emigrate, uh, they had uh, they had very difficult lives. You probably, if you do some logic, you've probably heard of Gerhard Gensen. Gerhard Gensen was pupil of Hilbert. He invented this thing that's called natural deduction and proved a theorem, which is called cut elimination theorem. You know how Gensen ended? Well, Hilbert was a formalist. And when Nazis came to power, Nazis thought that every formalism, including logical formalism, is anti-German because the German spirit is visual. This is what they call Anschauung. And the Germans will be doing Anschauliche Geometry and Anschauliche Mathematik. Gensen wanted to save the heritage of Hilbert. And Hilbert was under the suspect that he's Jewish. So there was this big danger that the whole Hilbert school will be declared to be Jewish mathematics. So what did Gensen do? Anybody knows? He became member of the SS and was killed by the Russians. So much about history of logic in 20th century. Uh, the, the Tarski story uh, is equally tragic, but I won't tell it now. Uh, it's not so about Tarski, it's the story about the seminar, the member of which was Tarski. So, and it's an it's a immensely tragic story. Okay, so this was the argument for this part. Don't be ashamed of your political views. See, it's, it's censorship. It's the power, as Foucault would put it. I think what he says in, in, what he says in Lithuanian is uh, fill in the, right? I'm starting to understand. Yeah. So this was the argument for don't be ashamed of your political views. I don't think that philosophers in analytic tradition should hide their political views. I think whichever political views we have, we should defend them with all the argumentative stuff that we've learned uh, in logic, in theory of argumentation, etc. But if you want to get engaged in practical life, if you've got to get engaged in real life, it is sometimes better to hide the rigor of one's philosophical argument and add some literary flavor. So my advice was the following. When I was writing, uh, I was writing newspapers, I was writing political stuff, I would usually begin with the deductive argument, premises and conclusions, all enumerated. What you do for the newspaper is you delete the numbers. Then you put the thing one after another, you, you change the point into comma, and you put a joke before the conclusion. <laughs> the rest is logic. Thank you. And I have, I, have, I have a credible threat. If there are no questions, I will continue with the talk. I have <laughs> one third of the talk left. Yes. Is not an okay. argument. Could you uh, the argument about Elaine Bourdieu is not an argument. Oh. It's an antimon. Right. So no, it's it a, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a hominem thing, right? And but I mean, it's not a hominem. No, 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 no. I have nothing against but you. I'm saying, look, but you. Uh, it's what not that I. I mean, as I say, I mean, yeah. I agree. I agree with with, with some of your. I, I think. I mean, I think uh, Elaine Bourdieu is very interesting, but he's deeply. 
mistaken about certain things. I think he's deeply bluffing about everything he writes. I mean, if, if somebody says that the Russell's paradox can teach you about how to make revolution, how to restore communism, how, how do you restore communism? Well, look at the zermelo frankel set theory. That can be only bluff. I, I don't see that this can be anything more than a bluff. I'm, I'm, so the antimem is, is, is antimem in the sense that I have not put all the premises inside. I have not put all the terrible stuff that Badiou is saying. I sort of assuming that uh, I was wrong to assume. But you think you think there aren't positive things in Badiou? I mean, uh, he's. I don't know. I mean, he's raising interesting questions. I mean, um, for example. Well, I mean, one, his his book on Saint Paul is interesting. Oh, this I haven't read. This I was I was disgusted with the former stuff, so I didn't get to Saint Paul. Okay. I mean, maybe you should. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Oh, good. I I agree. I didn't read Saint book on Saint Paul. Um, but uh, well, I mean. The, Elaine but you is, uh, let's leave him on, on the side, okay. but I think, uh, but also, I mean, I, once again, I agree with your conclusion, or some of your conclusions, for example, about Michel Foucault, but, but uh, and I think best is misreading Foucault here. Yeah. And badly misreading, yeah. Yeah. and it's a kind of, and, and, right. I, and agree. I agree with uh, that, you know, his claim about sheer impossibility of referentiality is, is simply wrong. Yeah. I mean, but, but, yeah. but, I think one way of arguing and being more uh, just to Foucault is to say that um, this archival element of in, in, in his thought and theory is important for him because he doesn't deny the referentiality. Of course, of course. Uh, because that it's, it's crazy and, and exactly. it's exactly. crazy to do so. But, exactly. but in a sense, what he's asking is, I mean, he, of course he's not a traditional histo uh, historian who's saying, Who's trying to, right. as, as you put it, describe as uh, things were uh, in the past? But he's saying, well, what is the what is the purpose of, of right. this historical right. knowledge? Right. And then he says, this has to do with with power. And right. so so he so his history or his genealogy is philosophical, mm. right? mm. and and, and mm. rather than just a traditional um, positivist or not positivist right. Uh, right. historiography. Right. Right. No, I am okay. Yes. So I'm full of admiration for Foucault's work. So there we agree completely. So I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I agree with you that uh, these people are misrepresenting important parts of his work. Now let me, let me go a step further. Let me remind you of the things that are most famous in, you know, when you go to the cultural circle, politically engaged circles, etc., and say, okay, what have you read by Foucault? What do you like by Foucault? And what they will tell you is, usually they will quote Foucault documenting incredible things in the history of Western science, so psychology, psychiatry, etc. So one, one famous thing is the torture of a guy who attempted to kill the king. And you've got this detailed, detailed description of how the guy was torn apart by horses, etc. So there was first other kinds of torture, and then you finally the guy's getting torn apart. And it's, it's beautifully written. It reads like a novel. The other thing is uh, various great French psychiatrists, like Pinel, doing detailed, detailed, detailed plans of how you build a mental hospital and how you do the timetable for the mental hospital. And Foucault's huge ambition is to say, this I have documented super well. Every sentence in what I say is documentary. So there's no, no question of this history being constructed in any kind of fictional sense. Foucault is super proud. Uh, he did a book uh, called uh, Moi, Pierre Rivière. So it's uh, basically a re-edition of the diary of a killer. It begins, Moi, Pierre Rivière, ayant tué ma mère, mon père, et mes frères, me, Pierre Rivière, after having killed my father, my mother, and my brothers. 
and goes through the life of Pierre Riviere. And after the diary, you've got Foucault's reconstruction of how psychiatrists were advising, advising judges who were judging Pierre Riviere. So it's absolute fanaticism for documentation and absolute fanaticism for truth. Now, uh, my question is, you know, why didn't this survive? Why in the mainstream French philosophy, nobody is saying this is what historians should be doing? This is the proper task of historians. This is where Foucault can teach us. What you get as the continuation of Foucault is this kind of stuff that I've that I've been showing you. So this is the this is where the now I right, have. But, but yeah. I mean, my argument would be that it's yeah. a marginalization of Foucault, so to speak. You know that it's no. You know, these are people a, who adore a, Foucault. Foucault. Yeah, yeah. This is Pop Foucault. But I, this is it. This is, I should have said that. Yeah, it's, it's it's Pop Foucault, and this is the only Foucault that's surviving. What is your explanation for why did this happen? So uh, my explanation is. Is it about the talent? Of Yes, but I, okay, so I think we have, we need two different explanations for France and for America. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in France what happened was that philosophy, that, but I'm not sure, I talked to a, to a sociologist who is doing sociology of French philosophy teaching. So I'm, I'm trying to get data, but I'm, this is still just an impression. So uh, my impression is, so I, I can tell, I, I tell you two things, my impression about the Foucault stuff and my impression of what actually happened in France. So, but it's my impression, I'm not being dogmatic about that, I might be wrong. What happened, I think, was that around 75, year 75, plus or minus few years, there was a complete victory of this notion of public intellectual over the notion of normal university professor. So Foucault was going to demonstrations you know, every second week. Uh, Sartre would come to demonstrations. Uh, he was supposed to sort of you know, to be like seriously public intellectual. And then you got a competition of who is going to be more radical. So once, you, uh, once you, uh, you get this sort of competition, bad results follow. And I think what happened in France uh, then is the following. There were serious continental people, people who were academic philosophers. My example is Alain Regnaud, but there are others, uh, many others. Uh, Jacques Brunswick would be another name. So when you ask Alain, uh, what, uh, what's your, he said, well, you know, I've been taught by all these guys, but then I realized what I want to do is I want to do history of German philosophy. And he went to archive. And he's publishing stuff on, you know, the, the letter of Fichte to his friend in spring, you know, uh, whatever, 1812. You know, why it was in spring, why... You know, one would have expected that letter to have been written two months earlier. <laughs> uh, a whole lot of intelligent, talented people basically went into pure archival history of philosophy. So that the creative scene was left to the undisciplined creative ones who were getting more and more crazy. Not because they were crazy in the head, although the situation was helping craziness, but because there was this competition, who's going to be more radical? Who's going to do the thing in a more poetic way? So it's po poetics plus radicalness. But is it not a necessary part of going public? Sorry? Is it not a necessary part of going public? Well, I'm glad they threw me out of my newspapers <laughs> where I was writing. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, in America, it's a very different scenario. In America, the philosophy departments are occupied by analytic people, the ones who have money. But you've got the departments that have money that are not philosophy. So, for example, Foucault himself, he, he gave these fantastic lectures in America. It's very funny to listen to his lectures in English. It's like allo allo English, but it's beautiful content. Uh, he, all, he gave all these lectures in the Department of French. 
and his uh, host was uh, Rabinov, who was professor of French literature official. Others discovered departments of cultural studies, black studies, feminist and queer studies, etc. So basically what happens is you pour the philosophical content into highly politically engaged audience, which is not very good at philosophy. So what you need is enormous amount of popularization, basically throwing out most of the serious stuff. That's the second round. So you've got famous, famous philosophers, people like Derrida, who come to the English department, the cultural studies department, and they have to teach people who practically know no philosophy. And then what they do is this sort of mix of literature and politics. Now, suppose you are a young guy. You're a young gentleman. Not a lady. Ladies are not sufficiently aggressive for that. Uh, but you're a young gentleman who has to make a career in this situation. Uh, so you, you have to sell your books, basically. What do you do? You turn to complete pop philosophy. So you do things like uh, Lacan movies and uh, Wall Street crisis. <laughs> uh, sorry? Sorry? You're making a reference here, I'm sure. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think that this, on this last round, it's really the market that's deciding. You know, it's 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 uh, the only way you can you know the only way you can you can sell your books. This philosophy departments in America are being held by the enemy. You can't just repeat Foucault, Lacan, whatever. So you take a nice quote for Lacan, and you say, gee, you know, this is like the blockbuster movie X, and it applies to the political situation that we've got now. And you get the, this nicely politicized pop, pop philosophy. That's my, that's my theory of what, what happened. It's not much of a theory, uh, but that, that's how I, I'm, I'm seeing the development. But if, if, if one continues, I mean, the story in America is all, I mean, if you take Noam Chomsky, he's, he's an un outstanding linguist, right. yeah. but also an outstanding yeah. public yeah. intellectual, yeah. and he, he yeah. talks in, in a very understanding way. Yeah. Yeah, and here manner. you have, yeah, and here you yeah. have, and here you have, exactly, this is a good answer to the question whether it's necessary. No, you can do serious linguistics, and then you do political stuff as a hobby. And I think this is the right way to go. I, I am very much with Chomsky on this. You mean what this other guy, exactly, separate you separate. Thing. You separate. You can, you can have bridges, mm -hmm. but you know what is written for the wide audience, you know where you go, you know, popular and stuff, and you know what is, you know, the professional argumentation with professional standards and stuff. Thank you, Chomsky. Chomsky is a super good, I didn't think of that. I, I have a student who is working on the Foucault-Chomsky debate, so we've been going through the book, and shamefully I didn't, I didn't connect. I, I, I should have thought of that, yeah. Then I don't know if that is a good advice. <coughs> don't be ashamed of your political views. Like Chomsky, he's not ashamed of his political views. He's he's telling clearly yeah, what he is, thinks. But this is a risk because it's not very often, like Chomsky, that that you succeed to separate clearly those two fields. I see. Because otherwise, you go public with political views, you go public, and then you know. It's Involved right, right, right. But it's a psychological risk. It's not. Uh, it's not something that's necessary. I mean, you can. You can succeed. Yeah, sure. You can. You can. You can. If you are very smart and and if you are very honest, that's a that's a problem. That you have to be morally, morally honest, like Chomsky. And then you can say, okay, good. You know, this is the stuff that I'm doing. You know, God is telling me that you know I should fight for, you know, the poor. So I fight for the poor. And here I do the theory, and that's nice. That's that's okay. But the, there is another example, uh, also mm -hmm. maybe a good example, yeah. but a uh, different example. Okay. Jürgen Habermas in yeah. Germany. So he's yeah. a public intellectual. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. It's like Chomsky. Yeah. There is no, 
Yeah. But there is no compartmentalization. Right, you know, right, so right, yeah. His, his, right, you know, uh, right. Public stuff comes out of his communicative theory. Right, yeah, yeah, theory. yeah, yeah. yeah. So but this is when you do political philosophy. I mean, when you sort of do, eth it's, it's because it's communicative action, and then you can have some ethics, and then you pass nicely mm -hmm. into, into philosophy. So it's showing if Rawls had been left, if he had been more leftist, he would have had the same kind of possibility. Yeah, 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 I agree, I agree. I'm, I'm very much, I'm very much for it. And I think this is, you know, uh, it was, okay, here's the story. We're having a meeting of the European Society for Analytic Philosophy, the committee, and there is a lady from Canada, they're joining us, and she says, oh, you know, you will be laughing at me, you know, I am engaged in all these movements for uh, the rights of homosexuals. So her father is a member of the Canada Supreme Court, so she was writing stuff basically for Canada Supreme Court in favor of homosexual marriages. I said, you will, you will think I'm stupid. Uh, and then I said, do you know, but Pierre Jacob, the, the, uh, who is the deputy president of the committee, he's taking his children to demonstrations every Sunday. Mm. And Pierre says, oh, come on, Anna, you've always been on the left. You, you know better than I am. Mm -hmm. Turned out everybody is politically engaged. And everybody is politically engaged basically on the same side. But we don't know this about each other. Because it's analytic philosophy, so we don't talk about politics. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's somewhat impractical. And you project an image that you don't have to project. You can, I think you can be open about your, your views. And this, and the, the, it's nice in analytic philosophy, it's nice that you can have people who are politically totally opposed. Uh, here is an anecdote. Uh, I am, I'm telling this stuff the things that I'm telling you now. I'm telling this at a, at a meeting in Carlo Vivari, and there is Putnam and Quine, and Quine is dozing. And after we finish, I stand up, and uh, Putnam comes to me. He says, Netta, shut up. Don't, don't be so open about these political views, because Quine will get offended. They say, Jesus, Quine is sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> He's not listening to us. <laughs> Uh, but this is, a, this is an illustration of that you can have really people of completely different political opinions doing the same stuff in theoretical philosophy. So uh, John Searle is extremely right-wing. Uh, Quine was, is quite right-wing. Putnam is le was leftist. Now he moved uh, to uh, some sort of a bit of religious sentimentalism, but still not, not right-wing. But th at that time he was left. So people really politically opposed, doing the same stuff in theory, and then disagreeing about politics, which is almost impossible on the continental side. On the continental side, you partly your, your philosophy is defined by your political opinions. So I think I think we are in a better position on on, 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 on the analytic on the analytic side if it comes to politics. Any student questions? Do you think that the most important thing in philosophy is explanation, providing a clear argument? Uh, uh, no, no, writing clear arguments is a means. The end is really to understand, to get to know, and the important thing is, is to grab the right topic. Uh, it's easy to have explanations and it's easy to have a, a good argument with shallow topics. But the, the real, you know, we really need luck is to have the combination when the, you know, the, the, the topic is really deep and interesting, where you have sufficient understanding, uh, understanding that can generate explanation. And then you are also capable of putting it in, you know, in a nice argumentative form. So I did th these would be the levels, I think. Uh, so a uh, lot of analytic philosophy nowadays is doing is occupied with problems that are boring and that are, I think, peripheral. <coughs> and people just grab a problem. You, know, you have, I want to write a dissertation. There are thousands and thousands of people, and everybody has to write a dissertation. And so you grab a small problem, and you do it very pedantically, and you pass. 
Uh, but this is not glory. <laughs> this is not what, what philosophy is for. So you need, you need all the elements. You really need, uh, you, 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 need a good, you need a topic that is in self important, that is in itself something that's, that's crucial and fundamental. Then you need the, the intelligence and talent and everything to, to reach understanding. Then understanding could generate interesting explanatory stuff. Then the question is how to put it in a nice, the ni I think the nice argumentative form is the easiest. Actually, the easiest part. This is the only part that can be learned relatively mechanically. So here, here is an example. Uh, uh, a young colleague who says, well, you know, I really, I, she, uh, she, she teaches, she teaches uh, uh, applied logic. And she's, she's good looking. And she says, you know, I've got these terrible problems with boyfriends. Uh, you know, I explain to the guy why he's wrong. I give him this long deductive argument. <laughs> And then he disappears forever. He never comes back. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's the contrast between argument and understanding. Sh she's capable of, of doing beautiful arguments. We published her stuff. Uh, but in the concrete situation, she doesn't understand what the problem is. She doesn't understand the guy. She, she wants to, to, to keep the guy. That's the main stuff. It, it, she just doesn't understand what, you know, what his problem is, why is he reacting as he is. But she's able you know, to list his negative sides, you know, and create a beautiful convergent argument out of this. And, and, and this is why I'm saying that the argument is, argument is necessary, but it's the most superficial thing. It's the only thing that you can learn, you know, just by being trained with the whip, with the charm, with whatever, you know, somebody grabs you and teaches you. The other stuff is more difficult, is the, the depth and understanding. And, and this is, you know, this is where you need help from God, you know, you sort of pray every morning, you know, God give me a nice topic. That's the, that's the thing, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I would argue that, no, it's, it's not uh, necessarily praying by, you know, to God, but uh, engaging in, in, for that matter, in politics, in, in what you're passionate. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and defending echoes, for example. If it's your passion. Oh yeah, yes. no, no, no. This is no. I'm also. Sure. I'm, no, no. I'm with you. I think you should do it. I mean, we are, and, we are and talking. In this way, you learn right, about the right, world. Right, right, well. right. We are talking to, right. to to young people. I think it's the most essential thing, is to do what you really care about. What you what you deeply care about. You you pick up the topic and you pick up a standpoint. You say, this is what I want. This is what I believe, and now I want to understand and to develop, etc. And and this is this is something that. Where continentals were more successful because of all these things that I was talking about, uh, somehow this whole, whole emotional thing is more on the surface. But I think it's, it, is, it is essential for, for the work in philosophy that you have to do the stuff that you love. And it could be politics, or it could be art, or it could be uh, you know, wisdom, how, how to live wisely. It could be all sorts of things. But it's really important to have your heart, to have your heart in it. I, I, very often students come to me, they've read something fashionable, they say, oh, professor, you know, I would like to do this, and here are these two little arguments. And I say, no, no, look, this is all very nice. What do you think? Where is your heart? What, what would you like to defend? You know, what, what are you ready to quarrel about? And then the students say, no, this is, oh, actually, I'm interested in something completely different. <laughs> say, then do that. Do, do, do think where your heart is. Yeah, that we agree with. More student questions? More student questions? I, I'm yeah. not sure. I think that this conversation is rather naive, naive but um, mm -hmm. in your paper, you, you, you state, you basically refer to your uh, opinion that one should uh, employ the accommodationist view towards somehow uh, merging these two different, uh, I don't know, discourses, if one could call them. So, do you think it's, to, to be rather bluntly, do you think it's, it's actually possible, or is it just two wholly different bodies of methods, if, if one could call them methods, mm -hmm. this literary approach? Yeah. Or is it, is yeah. Are they not fundamentally somehow incompatible? I know, but the methods are incompatible, I think. Mm -hmm. The methods are incompatible. I think, the, I think we should, I think that the only chance nowadays, the only chance for philosophy to go on is to give up this very literary 
and and artistic way of way of writing uh, as a norm. You can do it if you are extremely good in the subject. You can allow yourself to, to sort of do it a bit. Nothing bad will happen. But it should not be the norm of writing. The norm of writing for philosophy should be the argumentative norm. But you can accommodate tons of ideas. You can accommodate tons of things. Uh, uh, we learn what was what is the real wisdom in continental philosophy, and then try to make it clear. And 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 that that's the idea. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's dangerous. I know you. <laughs> Come on. said that, I mean, he thinks that it just doesn't shed any light on understanding these, these issues. Um, what do you think about this? And, I mean, on the, on the sort of, according to Searle, that in the current analytic philosophy, there is so much concentration on the things which just doesn't shed light on understanding. I mean, he's not saying that there is I think he, yeah. I think we should I think that we should go case by case. I think we should go case by case. So uh, uh, when I was when I was roughly your age, I I uh, the dogma was that you have to learn formal methods and that by f you know, by using a lot of formal stuff you'll get super results. And then what happened was that technical formal problems were being sol sold as philosophical problems. So, uh, 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 so uh, uh, say, Suppose I'm permitted to do, uh, so suppose I am, suppose I'm obliged to do P. And then suppose I say, gee, you know, uh, if I'm obliged to do P, I can, uh, the, the tooth value of this thing will not change if I add a disjunct. So I can replace this with I'm obliged to do P or Q. So you give me a letter to post it, that's the famous form. Uh, I promise I post the letter, and then, of course, I'm obliged to post the letter, but then I can add a disjunct. I am obliged to post the letter or burn it. So, since this is the disjunctive obligation, I can say, well, I can, I can burn it. So it's okay if I just burn it. Uh, this was called paradox of, deontic paradox of something. It, of course it's not a deep paradox. It comes from the specific special uh, things about disjunction in logic. It has nothing to do with obligations, has nothing to do with permissions. <laughs> You've got tons of articles written about this. And the, the point of, the, of the, the, the whole thing is that the junction brings in irrelevant material. And every relevance logician will tell you, gee, you know, this is because classical logic allows importation of irrelevant material, period. So this doesn't advance your, this doesn't advance your knowledge. It's a waste of time. On the other hand, uh, you take game theory. Game theory tells you very often 
you know, when you're dealing with some with somebody, you know, uh, what are the rational things to do? And it can tell you, it can sometimes give you a list. You know, at least, you know, it's important not to end up in the worst situation that you were before. Or oh, it's important that everybody who is participating does not go into worse situation. That at least you, you, you stay where you are or you get better. Uh, this is called Pareto equilibrium. Or it can tell you, well, these are the optimal situations, these are the optimal positions, this is the optimum, uh, given what your opponent is playing. Uh, this is Nash equilibrium. Or it can tell you, well, this is the real optimum, this is really the best thing, if you could get the other player to, uh, to cooperate, that would be the best thing. Turns out, it's, it was extremely useful in biology. Nowadays, it's getting useful in sociology, and I'm slowly being converted to the view that it's useful in political theory. That it tells us really something about the rationality of collective, of you know, things like this. You know, <laughs> should, I, should I talk half an hour more or not? You know, uh, the, the the game theory, which is a formal, uh, which is a formal thing, with with the bad political history. Uh, uh, it's the, yeah, uh, uh, it can be, it can be s uh, seriously intellectually useful and super useful for philosophers to learn. So I really think it's, it's case by case, but uh, I disagree with Searle that this is nowadays the main danger. I think the main danger nowadays is not formalism. Less and less people are doing uh, formal stuff. Uh, the, I think the, great dan the biggest danger is this specialization where you go into small, small, small problems, you do only this one little problem for four years or five years, only you know, ten people who do the small problem talk to each other, and uh, uh, every year there are 50 publications about the small problem, and there are like 500 small problems. Uh, this is what happened in late scholasticism, and, and this, I think, is a danger that's now, now threatening threatening analytic philosophy. It's now it's, you know, with, with all these pirated books that you've got, you know, you can sort of even sitting nowhere, you know, sitting in my hometown, you know, you can get this tons of books. And at my age, you sort of know what you should read. I, I know what kind of stuff I should be reading. And, uh, you know, <laughs> professor, you know, the professor has to carry all this. Give and and then you know and then I ask you to return the thing and so you know, it's communicative action as these people would put it. And then come books. You know the mouse is there. Student comes said professor I would like to read something on something. I say, yeah super we've got material. You know and with mouse you don't carry this stuff. So the girl ends with six items. The six items are books. And then the one intelligent student once asked, oh, excuse me, professor, how many pages does every book have? So he said, well, it's not big. It's around 300 pages or less. He says, yeah, but this is 1,500 pages. I said, what? And then you realize that what you have to read, actually, comes to hundreds of books. And the book is 300 pages. So it's 30,000 30, pages that you, at the moment, you know, my super ego is giving me this list. And it's roughly 30,000 pages. I think this is the danger. I think this is the danger, is this, this specialization and, and hyperproduction and the, the, the really creative stuff doesn't come to the surface. You don't, you know, in 30,000 pages, you don't know which is the creative stuff, which is less creative stuff. You, you can rely on the legends. Yeah, yeah, that guy gave a very good... John Locke lectures, yeah, wonderful. Uh, I think this is the, the great danger, it's not formalism. Yeah? If I understood you right, you suggested that from the very beginning, Western philosophy was done in an explanationist way. Yeah. It was supposed oh, yeah. to explain everything. Yeah. And because of this, it is the, the current ten tendency towards quietism is wrong. It's one reason, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why it's wrong, yeah. Uh, wasn't it, isn't it so that uh, 
from the very beginning, uh, Western philosophy also had this uh, tenden tendency towards what is inexpressible and what is mystical, what cannot have an explanation. For example, Socrates uh, said that he knows only that he doesn't know anything. Or for example, the same Plato or Kant uh, had uh, some latest in their text that uh, leads us towards what is unexpressible. Yeah. 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 But see, okay, let me give you a practical answer. In Kant, this comes after 500 pages. Hmm. He's not saying, oh, you know, we should not explain. They say, okay, here's 600 pages of explanation. And then there is this one, you know, really mystical thing. Well, here I'll stop. But the, the, the great, I mean, uh, I'm not saying that the, the, there might be problems which, which we are not able to solve. I, I, I think, you know, that there might be things that we are constitutively not being created to solve. You know, God was playing games. He said, yeah, okay, you know, I've got chimpanzees. They can solve this and that. Uh, then we've got human beings, and they can solve a certain number of things. And then, you know, for uh, this uh, Gödel-type problems, I have created Gödel angels who can do that. Uh, that's not impossible. There could be limits. Uh, but you don't start by saying, well, it's not the task of philosophy to explain. You, you can end up by saying, no, this is really the wall. And then somebody says, yeah, but you know, uh, this is what we thought of Berlin Wall, and Berlin Wall is not there anymore, so maybe the cognitive wall will not be there after a while. And then I think it's better to be optimistic. But if you really feel, okay, that stuff can't be explained, yeah, maybe it can't be explained. But it, it, we shouldn't start with this. Hopefully not. <laughs> if there's not, then we yeah. thank you again. And that's it. Just yeah. uh, a very quick reminder for tomorrow's lecture. Tomorrow will be another lecture by the same professor, and it's going to be here at 5 pm, and it's called Thought Experiments. Okay, so this will be basically, it will be Plato, it's Plato's Republic and Social Contract uh, seen as examples of thought experiments. So if you are interested in political theory, come. If you are not, waste of time. But if you are, that's the, the topic. <laughs>